Blog Talk Radio. Namaste, folks. Welcome to Nature of Reality Radio. It is June 10th, 2015. This is your host, Andrew Fisher, broadcasting every Wednesday from the suburbs of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to expose the true and false nature of reality for what it is and what it isn't. Today on the show, Tris Lesage. We're going to be talking about a whole slew of subjects, metaphysics, parallel universes, ascension, mind, body, spirit stuff, how to achieve fifth dimension consciousness, even a little numerology here and there. And, uh, I listened to her interview with uh, Michelle Walling uh, the past couple days. That was mostly about parallel universes. We'll definitely uh, touch on some of that and many other things. I see area code 734 in the queue here. Trish, if that is you, I will get you on at no later than 10 past the hour. It says here, you have used self-hypnosis and past life regression for years. You're a best-selling author and writer of magazine articles on all the things I just mentioned. You have... Uh, Articles published in the Sedona Journal of Emergence, The Magical Times, and Walk-Ins, Mind, Body, Spirit, which are distributed by Barnes & Noble bookstores. Uh, you have written four books which became bestsellers upon publication, including Manifesting Success in Relationships, Career and Business via Numerology, Meditations for Past Lives, Star Seeds, Soulmates, and Beyond, How to Achieve Fifth Dimension Consciousness, and Traveling to Parallel Universes, and your site, www dot beyond three books dot com that's the word beyond the number three um and the word books dot com oh, excuse me beyond three d books excuse me it's beyond the number three the letter d and then the word books dot com oh actually um trish i see an area code uh, area code four eight zero in the queue if that is you and i think that probably is you area code seven three four um if you're calling in i won't be taking call ins until about uh an hour and 15 minutes into the show, so you're welcome to hang on. You'll be the first one to get the call, and if you're just listening, fine, but uh, uh, area code 480, that is probably uh, Trish. I'll get you on and no later than 10 past the hour, but first we are going to do the news, courtesy of Alex Jones and company at InfoWars, and uh, no surprise, there's a lot of Bilderberg stuff going on here because Bilderberg is meeting in, in Austria this year. I was at Bilderberg in 2012 in Chantilly, Virginia. That was a uh, that was an experience to remember. Got to hang out with Alex Jones and, and company there and a lot of other journalists who were uh, protesting outside the uh, the hotel room. But anyway, let's start, talk about the articles here. First article, the spirit of Jim Tucker seen at Bilderberg 2015. Is this to go, the ghost of Jim Tucker in Austria? There, Jim Tucker, the world-renowned Bilderberg journalist, he passed away because of a fall uh, in the not-too-distant past, um, like a year or two years ago. And uh, his uh, protege is taking over for him, and um, they think they may have seen the ghost of uh, Jim Tucker. There, I did see a picture here in the uh, Infowars articles um, photos here near the top of the uh, page. Here it looks like a spirit or an apparition of someone who could be mis- misconstrued as being uh, Jim Tucker. I suppose. I suppose the spirit of Jim might want to show up there to show people, hey, I'm paying attention to see what's going on here. I don't want Bilderberg taking over the world. There's a more corporate people involved in Bilderberg than there are political people, because corporations control politics to a greater extent than politics control corporations. But either way, fascism is emerging of political and corporate power. All right, next article, the most evil quotes from Bilderberg insiders. Bilderberg members explain how they want to eradicate your individual rights. Well, I don't have time to uh, go over these quotes, but a lot of the uh, evidence that Bilderberg insiders uh, – like Henry Kissinger, David Rockefeller, Zbigniew Brzezinski, and all the rest of them want to take over the world. They've made their quotes public in in their books and their articles, and and some people are like, well, I don't, I don't want to, um, I don't believe there's a global conspiracy to take over the world. Oh, really? Then how do you explain these quotes by Kissinger, Rockefeller, Brzezinski, and and all the rest of them? Oh, well, uh, I choose not to believe that. <laughs> you choose not to believe the sun came up this morning. <laughs> Come on, people, wake up. Wake up, wake up. If you're not going to believe it because you can't handle the truth, then you're only making it easier for the Bilderberg insiders to control the world. Now, they're not going to be able to take over the world because we're on a positive timeline and Mother Earth will never allow the new world order to succeed in its quest for global domination. But still, we don't want all the sheep out there making it easy for them. So wake up, will you, and believe what is hard to handle. Next article, Austrians mad as hell at Bilderberg 2015. Austrians upset about global elite uh, scheming in their country. Well, I'm glad to see the Austrians are uh, are waking up. Uh, last uh, few years, a lot of people were very, very mad at uh, Bilderberg for showing up in their country, and uh, Bilderberg might be back in America in uh, 2016. If they are, I will 
most certainly want to show up at the uh, meeting there. Even if it's in Canada, I'll probably go across the border to to meet up and protest. Uh, next article, frickin' laser beams. Boeing's weapons get sci-fi sound effects, but that's not all that's being influenced by science fiction. Boeing company, most uh, most known for airplanes, but now they're talking about weapons that they're using and uh, laser beam weapons. Well, that uh, doesn't astonish me at all. We got direct energy weapons up in uh, up in Earth's orbit. John Lear talks about that in my in my interview with him about how the direct energy death rays that are up in Earth's orbit could be used to dustify buildings that may have been they've been used to dustify the World Trade Center. Although some say it was also a uh, mini noose that took down the twin towers, some say harp was also used to take down the twin towers. A lot of different technologies were used apparently, and that's why it's so hard to figure out exactly what happened on 9/11. But hey, if they had the technology, they could certainly use it. And uh, laser beams from Boeing's—not <laughs> shocking at all. Next article: Convicted criminal David Petraeus to represent U.S. at Bilderberg. Former CIA boss um, excused from uh, prison uh, crucial to Bilderberg. Mass surveillance agenda. Yes, uh, Bilderberg's um, Bilderberg was certainly uh, on mass surveillance to be part of their uh, agenda. So would all the other uh, groups. And then the uh, Illuminati Ladder of Authority, the surveillance system, is their uh, um, basically the arch that holds the, the the keystone that holds the arch of tyranny together. Excuse me, David Petraeus. Uh, didn't he say we're spying on you through your washing machine? Um, publicly, and some people, they just wouldn't believe that because they thought it was too crazy to believe, and then because of the snow and leaks, we all found out it was true, and they can just put this stuff in plain sight, can they? So it's not too shocking that uh, he would represent the United States at uh, Bilderberg. Excuse from prison, I didn't uh, see much of that, but um must play ignorance on that, him being excused from prison and all. You guys can check that out yourself if you want. Next article, a uh, 500 euro fine or two weeks in prison for entering giant Bilderberg security zone. Video and audio, re- audio banned. Complete tyranny in place for secret elite meeting. Yes, um, I wasn't there when it happened in Chantilly in 2012, but the, well, yeah, because I was only there for one of the three days. But the day before, some guy just walked in the street and then a bunch of police jumped on him, took him down and arrested him. And, um, and sometimes some taxi cabs that were dropping people off at the uh at the taxi cab stop down the street they were just pulling over those taxi cabs just to annoy them and harass them uh, the, those police i'm sure they maybe didn't want to do that to us but they were told to do it by the Bilderberg group saying do this or you or we're gonna make you pay we know you don't want to be tyrants but we're gonna force you to be tyrants because we're tyrants that's that's what Bilderberg would do to all those police guards who are watching uh next article Bilderberg 2015 to focus on rebranding authoritarianism. Uh, Global League schemes to put squeeze on orderly, ordinary citizens. wonder why they chose authoritarianism instead of uh, totalitarianism uh, here, because they would certainly want totalitarianism if they could. But uh, but they're rebranding it. I wonder what that means. They've always been focusing on rebranding authoritarianism, but maybe now they're going to get a little more desperate because they know that the uh, – the Archon control system has been cannibalizing itself since uh, 2011, and if you really want to be specific, October 28, 2011, that was the uh, end date of the of well, Carl Co- Johann Kaliman's end date anyway of the Mayan calendar, not the calendar, not the one in 2012. And a lot of timelines came together on that day. And I bet if you needed to pick a day in 2012 when the Archon control system was officially cannibalizing itself, it probably would have been uh, would have been that day. So now they're going to get desperate, and while you may see tyranny in some pretty ludicrous and out- outrageous ways in the near future, that's just a sign that the Archon control system is uh, losing power and is getting desperate. One last article here. U.S. prepares uh, plans for more troops, new bases in Iraq, officials say. The United States is expected to announce on Wednesday plans for new military base in Iraq's Anbar province. <sighs> They lied about weapons of mass destruction many years ago, and now they want new, more troops and a new base. Will the apathetic American public allow for this? Well, they might because they're apathetic, but wake up, folks. There's no reason for us to be in Iraq, no reason at all. All right, but anyway, without further ado, um, all right, that area code 480 has hung up here. I guess maybe that wasn't uh, wasn't Trish. So area code 734, let's see who this is. Uh, area code 734, is this Trish Sage? Yes, this is. Oh, I'm glad to see uh glad to say it was you. Don't happen to the other caller, but maybe he'll uh he'll call in again. Glad to have you on. I uh, 
just to prepare for this, I did listen to your interview with Michelle Walling, but that was mostly about parallel universes. We're going to get a lot deeper and, uh, into things in uh in this interview but uh boy where to start there are so many things here uh all right let's start with your energy healing work it says you are an energy healer of the violet flame which is a healing technique that is a combination of visual and energy healing uh let's talk all about energy healer being an energy healer of the violet flame and tell the, those who are ignorant what the violet flame is sure of uh, the violet flame works as you mentioned it's energy healing so it works on an energetic level but it also affects us on every level physically mentally emotionally spiritually on the cellular level and every level because what it does is um it's a visualization technique it combines visualization and energy healing and what it does is um if you have an issue for example that you want to deal with, um, you can use it. And the idea is is that since you're working on an energetic level, it converts or transmutes all of the negativity and negative energy in regards to that issue to positive energy and divine light. And so it resolves the issue. And um, you, the person who uses it, may feel a lot of cleansing or they might not feel it. It just depends on how much emotional baggage and other baggage there is associated with the issue. And if they do experience cleansing, it might come in the form of sneezing, runny nose, going to the bathroom more often than than usual, sweating, you know, kind of like cold-type symptoms, you know, so that you can release all of the toxin, everything that's built up over the years in regards to the issue because what happens is we experience traumas, of course, in life, and we carry around this emotional baggage. You know, we feel anger, we feel sadness, hatred, all of this, and we carry that around with us, and um, the violet flame allows us to let go of all of that and also resolve some issues that we're having. So it's a very powerful very helpful, beneficial. Um, It's been successful um, at eliminating fears and phobias, uh, negative thoughts. And um, I don't advertise it because I'm not a doctor, but I've used it on my own medical issues and also to help family members with medical issues. And, um, you know, you can use it for stress and anxiety and just the host of, you know, issues that you can use it for. Thank you very much. You've also used uh, self-hypnosis and uh, past life regression. I guess we can kill two birds with one one stone here. Uh, when it comes to hypnosis, I don't know if this is um, the kind of uh, hypnosis that you would be involved in, but when it comes to like seeing who's the best kind of hypnotist, well, let me give an example of something I experienced um, way back in the day. Um, in the uh, summer of uh, 2003, when I was at Penn State University for a summer study program, this hypnotist named Tom DeLuca uh, just did a show for us, and he put all of pe- a lot of people on a stage, and he did not tell anyone that it was, was in his uh, hypnotism audience on stage, uh, come up here with the mentality that you want to be hypnotized. Um, but when he found out that he couldn't hypnotize people, he did kick them off stage. Well, what was he supposed to do? That's what hypnotists have no choice but to do. When they can't hypnotize someone, they kick them off stage and everything. Well, this... In my um, senior year of high school at the post-prom party, we had another hypnotist, but this hypnotist, before um, having selecting people to come up to get hypnotized, he said, come up here with the mentality that you want to be hypnotized. Well, many would assert that Tom DeLuca was the better hypnotist simply because he did not have to ask people to come up with the mentality that they want to be hypnotized, although both hypnotists, they did have to kick people off stage when they realized that they couldn't hypnotize them, but that I'm I'm sure is a different uh, form of hypnotism than the kind you're involved in, but maybe you could um, uh, help us explain why some hypnotists would have to tell people, um, act like you want to be hypnotized for me to be able to hypnotize you while others wouldn't, regardless of whatever hypnotism you're using. And then after talking about self-hypnosis and hypnosis in general, please tell us all about past life regression. 
sure. Yeah, what you're describing, those types of shows in which there's an audience, that's stage hypnosis, and I'm not involved with that, but, you know, those are sometimes the types of shows that you might see at the, you know, county fair or, you know, wherever, and sometimes they'll make people get up there and cluck like a chicken and flap their (laughs) wings, you know, it's kind of can be, you know, a comedy show sometimes, but um, there are, you know, usually a lot of people can be hypnotized, but there are some people that cannot be hypnotized, and it's usually people that are afraid, um, people that um, are mentally incapacitated or have mental, you know, issues, um, people that, of course, are drunk, can't be hypnotized, small children sometimes, you know, can't be hypnotized, and um, that's why hypnotherapists or hypnotists, they'll have a talk with whoever they're going to hypnotize prior to hypnotizing them to try to dispel their fears. You know, some people, for example, their spouse might drag them into a hypnotist's office to try to resolve their issues, but they don't really want to be there or they're afraid or it's against their belief systems and, you know, their religion might, you know, be against it. They might think it's the work of the devil or whatever. I mean, there could be a lot of host of issues. And so if people have this kind of preset, you know, preconceived notions about it, it can actually interfere with um, their ability to be hypnotized. So that may be why he mentioned to the audience, you know, for those who want to be hypnotized. And, you know, usually people can if they're not afraid. And, um, you know, hypnosis is nothing actually to be afraid of. It's actually a state of relaxation, and the hypnotist will help to relax you and deepen the relaxation, but it's a heightened state of awareness, and you can turn off temporarily your waking conscious mind and the chatter of your waking conscious mind, and actually what you do is you can delve into the subconscious mind, which is where our past life memories are stored, and that's where the past life regression comes in. The past lives, their memories are stored in the subconscious mind. And so past life regression is basically just hypnosis. And you can do it, do self-hypnosis and regress yourself to remember your past lives, or you can have a hypnotherapist do it for you. And um, so that's pretty much what it is. Hypnosis is very similar to a state that we're, we go in and out of every day, like when you're reading a book and you're very engrossed in it and you kind of don't, you know, realize what's going on around you because you're so into the book and you can see the scenes unfolding in your mind's eye type of a thing. That's a similar state of mind uh, that we're in with hypnosis, although you're very, you're in a heightened state of awareness. You're not asleep, so you don't ever get stuck in hypnosis and not get out there are no cases of that happening so it's pretty powerful it can be used for weight management stopping smoking pain management like people for example use it before they go into the dentist office so that they can you know get rid of their fears of going to the dentist or manage their pain um there's hypnobirthing which is used in when women are in labor um, people use it for to improve their sports performance, like golf, um, king anxiety. Um, it, it can be used for many, many areas, as well as you know, metaphysical areas like past life regression and other areas. Thank you very much. Uh, you've um, let's, let's see well, all the subjects here we could uh, talk about. Uh, I guess I'll go by your use your website here as a guide and talk use your books uh, here as a guide uh, in regards to the uh, about the book um, section. Let's start with the uh, how to achieve uh, fifth dimension consciousness. Um, the book covers the following topics. It says what our energy vibration is and why we should be concerned about it. Well, we should be concerned about it because we're obviously not manifesting to our full potential. That's the uh, number one problem in a, uh, in a nutshell. But um, I guess before we start talking about, well, you could talk about the book as you discuss this, but there's a few things about uh, fifth dimension uh, consciousness I'd like to um, talk about. First of all, a lot of people um, seem to, there seems to be a debate as to what um, dimension or density, oh, since I mentioned that, 
there is a debate over what the difference is between dimension and density. If you uh, see a difference between those two terms, by all means, uh, tell us what the difference is. If you use those words interchangeably, then let us know that you use those two words interchangeably. But but anyway, that's for all intents and purposes a side issue. The point is, a lot of people can't seem to agree on whether we're going going to go into the fourth dimension or the fifth dimension. I've heard different things like uh, Dolores Cannon, the late Dolores Cannon. She said that we will go straight to the fifth dimension. The, the, I mean, there is no time. Time is an illusion, she says. And the only difference between the third and the fourth dimension is um, that time is an illusion. But since in the fourth dimension, time doesn't exist. But since time is an illusion all along, we're just going to go to the fifth dimension. Um, I don't really understand how she comes up with that idea, but that's what what she said. And I remember Lauren, Laura Eisenhower saying that in my interview with her, that the uh, fourth dimension is cluttered with a lot of uh, malevolent entities, especially the lower fourth dimension, and that's why we would just pass it and go straight into the fifth dimension. So there seems to be other disagreements about, among people as to why we would just skip over the fourth dimension entirely and go straight to the fifth, but others say, no, 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 we would definitely go into the uh, fourth dimension first. So this debate over whether we're going to go straight to the fifth dimension and whether we're going to go into the fourth dimension first, and also if there's a difference between dimension and density, please tell us. You got the floor. Tell us about this subject. Sure. Um, it's interesting that you brought up the um, difference between density and dimension because I've run across that same issue myself in books that I've read and you know online forums or whatnot. And... I actually use the two words interchangeably because, you know, some people say we're at third density and we're in the third dimension. And it's interesting because I even mentioned that in the introduction of my book, Traveling the Parallel Universes, I tell people flat out, don't get caught up by the fact that some people, you know, claim that we're not in the third dimension because dimensions are um, lengths of measure, like length, height, width and that sort of a thing and um but everybody uses the word dimension to refer to where exactly we are and so a lot of people use it interchangeably and I do as well and so for my book's purposes I use I mention the fifth dimension meaning you know fifth de- density which is the same thing and um for me you know it's the third dimension is where we're at and I've also heard the same thing that you have that some people say that we're going to the fourth dimension or fourth density and then some claim you know the fifth and it's my understanding and um, you know there's no way to prove it I guess until we all get to where we're going but it was my understanding that we were to go to the fifth and even the um you know heaven or the afterlife and the fourth dimension is supposed to shift upwards also probably to the sixth is what my understanding was and so that's what my take has been on it and i for me personally um I, i've heard a lot the same as you about time you know not existing it's an illusion and everything happening all at once but for me, I've also read personally as well other people saying that, no, that's not correct. You know, time does exist also in the fourth dimension or the heaven or the afterlife as well as in the fifth dimension. Um, nuclear physicist Thomas Camp, uh, Thomas Campbell, I believe is his name, he wrote a trilogy of books, My Big Toe, and he mentioned that time does pass in the fourth and fifth dimensions as well as it, you know, passing, of course, here in the third dimension. It just passes in different increments. So, for example, we know how it feels to be here and, you know, you could sit here and, you know, feel when an hour of time has passed pretty much or 10 minutes or whatever. We know what that feels like. We can perceive how much time has passed here in the third dimension well, the idea is that when you are in the spirit world, it's said that time slows down, your perception of time slows down. So what may be 24 hours to us may be a few minutes to them in the fourth dimension and even less so in the fifth dimension. So 
it, it's my understanding that everything isn't happening all at once. All of the potentials that could possibly ever exist and happen in the now moment you know, may exist all at once, but we're not necessarily living out all of the potentials from the past, present, and future. It's my understanding that linear time was created so that we could pass on from one event to the next, to the next, to the next for soul learning. And so that's why there's linear time, and it exists as well in the higher dimensions, the same as it does here. It's the only difference would be that the perception is different and our mind will slow down as we go to a higher level of consciousness and our perception of time will slow down and we may not be sitting there in the fourth dimension or the fifth dimension staring at a clock on the wall or looking at our watch or whatever. So that's pretty what, pretty much what my, you know, interpretation is of it or what my feelings are of it. Yeah, it is a confusing issue because Andromeda Council contacted Tolik not that long ago. made a made a video explaining how uh, how his ET contacts perceive time. And while he says that in the fourth dimension, his contacts have told him there is no sensation of time. He said that his contacts for them seventy five human years here on Earth is the equivalent of one day for them. And someone who hears that would say, "Well, wait a minute that that does that means time is not an illusion to them. It just has a whole new different scale if you will but it's not an illusion so how can people say that it's uh an illusion to those ets when they just explained that 75 earth years to us is one day to them do you by any chance have any um answer to that question or is it just too hard for you and everyone else to comprehend and i i think it's related to you know what i was mentioning you know if those ets are existing at a higher level of consciousness than what we are if their energy vibration is higher and their level of consciousness is higher than ours they their perception of time is going to be slower than ours so it makes perfect sense to me that if 75 years pass here on our third dimension earth and their consciousness level is up at 3.75 or 4 or four and a half or wherever it is that makes perfect sense to me then that 75 years could pass here but to them it doesn't seem like 75 years it might seem like only a year or two so that i what that person said to me makes absolute sense okay and on regards to time the whole issue of time speeding up some would say no 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 that's a bad way of looking at it it's not that time is speeding up it that it's that time is being more compressed to a point related to this is some people say that ascension is not a good word to use because you're not ascending above anything. You're just moving closer to the point of infinite consciousness. But yet some people just use the word ascension anyway, because well, the word stuck and also people use the phrase time speeding up because it's stuck. But like I said, that's not the right way of looking at it. The right way of looking at it is, is that time is compressing closer to a point where it's non-existent and that produces an illusion that it's speeding up. Do you think that's a that's a good way of looking at it? Well, I I know, you know, from my personal experiences that I had and I, I'm certainly not there anymore. Um about 5 or 6 years ago, I had gone through so much cleansing, you know, with energy healing and going through a big group of us felt like we were going through cleansing automatically like someone or something or some automatic process was cleansing us and we were going experiencing the same cleansing symptoms at the same time and we were all connect you know connecting and communicating with each other online and it just seemed like you know as we were going through this eventually I reached a state of permanent peace, bliss, love, and joy without any effort required on my part. It just, you know, that's where I was at and operating, even though I was still here in a 3D world, you know, with all the chaos and the problems that exist here. And when I reached that level of consciousness, I was there and stayed there without any effort on my part for two or three months and then came crashing down eventually. But when I was in that state of existence, the perception of time actually seemed to slow down 
quite a bit. Like I would actually start to lose chunks of time, which was very interesting, and other people experienced the same thing. Um, we could look at the clock on the wall, and it would say that an hour had passed, but to us we felt like only a few minutes had passed. And um, sometimes it seems like we would lose chunks of time altogether. You know, you would look at the clock and have no idea what happened in the last two hours. Two hours had passed, you have no recollection of what happened. So that sort of a thing was happening. And what I remembered happening during that point in time when I was in that wonderful state of existence was I time was passing by. It seemed to pass by more slowly than what I was accustomed to. But what was interesting is I didn't dwell in the past and I didn't worry about nor think of the future. I was living in the now moment. And I could dig up memories from the past if I wanted to, and I could think of the future if I wanted to, but I didn't really go there. It was just in the now moment, living in the now moment, just going from one event in my life to the next and to the next and to the next and just, you know, I don't want to say it was robotic, but it just seemed like, you know, living in the moment of now. So I think when people mention that time is an illusion and not existing anymore, that may be what they're speaking of, that we will eventually get to the point in which none of us are, you know, dwelling in the past and thinking of we could have, should have, should have type of a thing and dwelling about the past and worrying about the future. We'll just be living in the moment and you know, going from one, you know, footstep at a time, you know, through our lives. And so I think that's what people could be referring to. And um, I noticed because, um, and I hate to get really deep into this, but um, I um, have been experiencing the phenomenon of alternate realities, uh, actually physically slipping over elsewhere into alternate realities while I'm physically awake in my physical body, not doing any meditation or anything. I'm walking down the street or driving my car down the road, and it so happens that people aren't generally aren't around when it takes place, mysteriously, you know. But um, what I've noticed is if I cross over into an alternate reality that is very chaotic feeling, in regards to the energy, it seems like the time there passes by much more quickly. Um, what I feel should be an hour in time that what I'm used to feeling like an hour, I can look at the clock and three hours have already passed by. So it can work in the opposite, your perception of time slowing down when you're going up in higher consciousness and your perception of time speeding up as you're descending in consciousness, and so I, I wanted to bring that up too. It, I, it all depends on where you are, you know, what universe you're in, what your energy vibration is, and if it's changing up or down, basically. Thank you. Your book also covers ascension symptoms. I've uh, had a few ascension symptoms. I remember on uh, full moons and new moons and on the uh, – Spring equinox in uh, 2014, I seem to recall having a uh, terrible migraine that day. Um, I guess you could maybe enlighten us on what exactly is, I mean, it makes sense that it would happen on days like um, new moons, full moons, eclipses, and equinoxes and solstices, but enlighten us on the different types of ascension symptoms and why they happen on those uh, those specific days. Sure. Um, well, it seems like it was happening more in the past than what it's been happening, you know, recently, but it seemed like a group of people, there were different waves of people that were going through Ascension, and Dolores Cannon mentioned it as well in her material and her books and some of the articles she's written about different waves or groups of people that were going through ascension, the first wave, the second wave, the third wave, and it seems like for a while there, you know, groups of people, these waves were going through and experiencing the same ascension symptoms at the same time, and then, you know, it seemed to be more on an individual basis after that, but some people, when they go through ascension, uh, they can go through a long, long list of 
symptoms and because your energy vibration is increasing, it's raising, um, you might go through cleansing such as, you know, similar to what I described when I used the violet flame for healing. So a lot of people, when they go through ascension, experience flu-like symptoms. They might feel tired and lethargic. They might have a fever or just, you know, their body feels a little warmer or colder than it usually does. Um, sweating, sneezing, running nose, runny nose, going to the bathroom more often than they usually do. Um, waking up in the middle of the night quite often. Um, some people experience heightened intuitive and psychic abilities and, you know, having abilities that they've never had before, you know, because the veil, what we call the veil, is tending to lift. And so the, the separation that once existed between where we are here in the third dimension Earth and the spirit world tends to thin. The the separation and the veil tends to thin, and so people may experience more, you know, psychic abilities or psychic abilities that they never had before. And just a long list of um, symptoms like perception of ch- time changing, um, sometimes temporary memory loss as, you know, purging and cleansing is taking place. You know, some people feel tingling on their body and vibrations, you know, inside their body and on the outside of their body. Um, Some people, you know, have, you know, a lot of sweating and perspiration because the body's cleansing away toxins and, you know, energy and everything that we don't need anymore and just uh, many, many different symptoms that people tend to experience. Thank you. And the um, upcoming lunar eclipse on uh, September 28th, it's the final eclipse in a tetrad. Um, It's a couple of interesting things about that day. That Pope is going to be in Philadelphia that day. I was thinking about going down there to protest, but I changed my mind on that when I realized that it's going to be indoor an indoor event at the Pennsylvania Convention Center, and all of Philadelphia is going to be shut down that day, traffic wise. So there really isn't going to be see me anybody see me protesting if I were to go outside there at the convention center. Maybe I'll start a few petitions and such. But one thing I am going to be doing, I am going to be going down to uh, the American Southwest to participate in a peyote ceremony. And my devoted fan uh, Sean Cohen told me she thinks I'm out of my mind doing a peyote ceremony when at the same time, mind you, as the lunar eclipse, I'm actually going to be taking the peyote about an hour before the uh, eclipse starts, and then it'll be over by around, I guess, the time the eclipse is over, and she was basically telling me that's basi- that's a recipe for ascension symptoms, the eclipse in of itself, but you're really screwing around with yourself if you're going to do a peyote ceremony at the same time as that. So since you're an expert on ascension systems, could you maybe give me any advice or anybody else in general some advice if they decide to do crazy things like peyote ceremonies during astrologically significant events like a lunar eclipse? Um, yeah, I... If, you know, people know that, for example, say tomorrow we're going to go through some sort of cleansing or some types of symptoms for ascension, I I don't think I personally would want to be (laughs) experimenting with anything else or going and doing peyote or (laughs) anything, you know, because, I mean, it just might be too much. I mean, ascension symptoms can tend to be strong sometimes. Sometimes they're subtle but you never know how it's going to be. So if someone's going and doing, you know, peyote or whatever, I mean, they may be totally, it might be a recipe for totally, you know, overdoing it, if you ask me. Well, I'm going to have a shaman watching over me, so I think I'll be able to uh, be able to handle it. And I'll be right in the middle of the desert, so I'm sure I'll be uh, I'll be okay. But enough of, <laughs> enough of that, enough about me. Let's get back to... Um, some of your uh, specific work here in regards to your fifth dimension consciousness work. Um, Okay, how to become your divine self and achieve fifth dimension consciousness? Well, the simple simple answer is just um, get rid of love, uh, excuse me, get rid of fear, show more love, get rid of uh, service to self, show more service to others. But in reality, it's a lot more uh, complex than that. So tell us, how do you become your divine self and achieve fifth dimension consciousness? 
sure, and and you hit on some good points. Um, it is you know based on you know being more service to others oriented instead of you know service to self, and um, I think love is a big key, and um, it's not necessarily you know always you know the mushy romantic love that you know everybody talks about, but love in general, you know, just loving everybody and everything, you know, humanity, the animals, you know, plant life, everything. And um, because, you know, when we get to that level and operating on that level of love, then, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't have it in our heart to harm others and to hurt others, to be greedy, to, you know, provoke war on others and all of the things that go up on here in the third dimension earth so it's really about rising above this third dimension mentality of you know conquering others and greediness and competing against one another and hurting one another and all of that and you know turning it off and trying to isolate ourselves from it the best as possible and try to just be you know, the best that we can be and be the most positive people that we can be because it's, you know, I know it's a challenge because the world that we live in is very chaotic. It can be very dark and negative. I mean, there's beauty to it too, of course, but if we make a conscious effort, each and every one of us to strive to be better and to, um, you know, be better people. And when I say that, I don't mean, you know, be better you know, go out and make a million bucks type of a thing. I mean, you know, being genuine, honest, you know, good-hearted people. um, I think, you know, if enough people do that, humanity in general could, you know, go and transcend the third dimension and make it to the fifth dimension level of consciousness. Okay, let's talk about... uh time wise when this will happen well there's a lot a lot of stuff in regards to this issue i mean a lot of people when when they say we're going to be going to the fourth or the fifth dimension in the very near future a lot of people hear that and say oh no 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 not this again we've been down this road before and it's always ended in disaster and dismay i mean just a few examples back in the 90s ian zell lungold greg braden and david ike at one point or another were talking about how um at, like by the 2012 mind calendar end date, the Earth would spin in the opposite direction in conjunction with a great consciousness shift. Well, that did not happen. The Earth didn't change spinning the opposite direction and not much of a huge consciousness shift in conjunction with that. Um, also, uh, George Kavaslis, he said that on the uh, March-spring um, equinox that um, – well, actually, the time period between the December 21st, 2012 solstice and the March-spring uh, equinox, Earth would um, – go straight up on its axis and then it would blossom into a uh, fifth dimensional planet and we'd all go along for the ride. Well, that did not happen. Alex Collier in the mid nineties, he was talking about how in December, mid December, 2013, we would ascend into fifth dimension consciousness. That did not happen. And last but not least, Andromeda Council contacted Tolek. He said that in January 2014, we're going to ascend into fourth dimension consciousness and it's going to be a lot more lovely life. Well, that did not happen. Now, why were all those people wrong? Well, the short answer is because we were never on that timeline. And the reason we were never on that timeline is because the creator gods at the top decided that it wasn't time for humanity to undergo that experience at any of those times that those people that I just mentioned were talking about it. However, there are some other people saying, no, 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 it's going to be different in the near future. And I'm talking about the uh, 2017 date. Like Alfred Weber has talked about it. Tolek said he's ET contacts have told, told him about it. And Reiku Solandich, who, have, who I had as a guest on my show, ET contact, he, he has said his ET's contacts have told him that 2017 things are going to be much more different. We will um, ascend into 40, 5D by then. And I, I told him everything I just told you about all those people that were wrong. How can can you tell us that it's going to be different this time? Can you be sure? And he said, oh, yeah, I'm sure of it. However, some other people like uh, Bashar um, at the uh, N5D Cosmic um, Awakening Conference in Los Angeles in January 2014, I had the chance to uh, speak to uh, Daryl Lanka, who, chan- who channels the E.T. Bashar 
And I told him, like, when are we going to ascend into the fourth dimension where we will have crystalline bodies and have all the, do all the other things that fourth dimensional beings can do? And, and he said, you already are in the fourth dimension. Do you mean the fourth density? And I was like, uh, I don't know. Uh, do I? And, and he said, well, you already are in the fourth dimension because you exist in three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. You can think of dimensions as a country and different densities as states within that country. You will remain in um, physicality for another thousand years. In that time, you will move in and out of different densities. And when I brought that up to uh, Ray Kusalanik's attention, he said, I don't know what the hell he's talking about saying that we're, you're going to remain in physicality for another thousand years, because as far as I'm concerned, you're going to have a lot more pleasurable crystalline life in around 2017. So this is getting really far out. And to complicate this even further, my guest last week, Lily Earthling, she talked about how like people like Tolek and also Simon Parks there they're frauds, but they don't try to be frauds. They think that they're doing good, but their ETs are all ET contacts are all confused because of like Stargates on Earth. I do wish I I listened to what uh, re listened to what Lily told me. I'm definitely going to have to re listen to that interview with her when I have both Simon Parks and Tolek on my show in the very near future because she says that they don't know what they're talking about because their ETs don't know what they're talking about when they say that we're going to ascend because you can't ascend. Um, on Earth while you're alive, you have to die first before you um, ascend. Your consciousness soul leaves your skin suit and ascends into a higher dimension. But all these other people like Kusalanich Tolik, they said, no, 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 she, th that's not the case. We can ascend while we are still alive, and it would be instantaneous, uh, blink of an eye kind of thing. So um, I've babbled long enough. What do you have to say about all these people giving different time frames from when we're going to ascend, as well as Lily Earthing's claim that you can't ascend while you're alive on planet Earth. You have to wait until your skin suit dies. Um, it's very interesting. From what I understand, there have been previous attempts already for humanity to ascend. And I was just reading some information today about it, matter of fact, and, you know, during the times back in Lemuria, it said that humans were to ascend and something happened and they, they did not. And um, also during different time periods like ancient civilizations, um, you know, Mayans, the Mayans and others. Um, however, if you use any sort of self-hypnosis or anything and try to ask questions and figure out about the Mayans, you're told they didn't ascend and you can, you're blocked from getting any further information, and that's happened to myself and to other people. Um, so there have been other attempts in the past with humanity in general and then different civilizations to ascend to a higher state of being or a higher um, earth, higher vibration earth. And I, you know, it's interesting that the one mentioned a thousand years, and I don't, you know, know exactly when it's going to happen, to be honest with you. But um, a few years ago, um, you know, it seemed like there were all of these, what people were calling portal dates, in which um, we were told that on such and such a date, um, we're all going to send, and each date came and passed, and we never did. And um, we were all told, back then I was writing a newsletter about Ascension, and other people were as well, and I could tell, I could feel these portal dates, you know, I knew when they were going to happen, but I also knew as the dates got closer that humanity wasn't going to ascend at that time. We'll have all different dates because there are possibly portal dates in which humanity can possibly ascend at that time, but when the date comes, not enough people are ready, and so we don't end up ascending as a whole. And so now, you know, the next date comes along, you know, this portal date, you know, six months from now. And so everybody's saying, yeah, yeah, in six months we're supposed to ascend, and then it comes and it goes. And all of these portal dates, it seems like there are several of them. It doesn't seem like there's just one and it's been like this for the last you know five six years at least or even more um in which these dates come and go 
but yet we were supposed to sin and we we don't. And um, I think there will be more of these dates in the future, to be honest with you. Um, I was feeling like um, December, um, around the 30th or 31st, um, somewhere in that time frame of um, 2015 and 16 would be other ones. And, but I know that, and I hate to um, squash everybody's, you know, anticipation, but those dates will come and pass the same as the other ones prior to it, I have a feeling. And I have felt intuitively that there's a possibility that after that point in time, the dates will be pushed out a lot further in the future, like 50 years down the road and 100 and then 1,000 like the one gentleman mentioned, and and it's not written in stone, of course. I mean, if we each, you know, make a conscious effort to do the best that we can, it may not happen. It might not be continually pushed out further and further, but intuitively that's the information that I received without even asking for it. It came to me that the dates keep coming and going because not enough people are ready and more dates are going to come. They're like portal openings that um, we have the chance to ascend, but if not enough people are ready, we we miss the boat pretty much, and then, then we have to wait till the next opportunity comes along, and then, you know, if that one, if not enough people are ready, we have to na- wait for the next one after that, and, you know, it's quite possible that if people don't, you know, wake up, that it, these dates can keep being pushed out further and further until we're out to that a thousand years that the gen spoke about. Hopefully, it doesn't take that long. I sure and the heck you know don't want it to take that long, and I know other people don't want it to neither. But I think we all need to uh, make a conscious effort to do the best that we can and be the best that we can, so that it's not pushed out another thousand years. <laughs> That's right, and uh, I forgot to mention Franco De Nicola. He also, uh, in my interview with him, gave 2017 as a time frame for 5D uh, consciousness ascension. But this upcoming September, I mentioned the um, final eclipse in the Tetrad on uh, the Blood Moon on September 28th when the Pope is in Philly and I'm going to be in the American Southwest trip and on peyote. Um, that eclipse, uh, aside from being the final eclipse in the Tetrad, it's very significant um, in regards that it's the time frame of a super Shemitah. Um, if anybody wants to listen to an interview with uh, Jonathan Kahn that he did with uh, Lee and McAdoo of InfoWars Nightly News not that long ago, they talked about the um, super Shemitah. There's like there's a Shemitah every seven years, and then there's a super Shemitah every 49 years, and the super Shemitah every 49 years is coming up in the time frame this September. They said that there's an asteroid that's supposed to hit the Earth around, um, some people say, around September 24th, although I did send Andromeda Consult contact Etolik an email about that, um, and he told me that his ET contacts have told him that they're going to make sure that that asteroid does not hit the Earth. Now, make of that whatever you will. Um, I'm sure the ETs would have the power to, to save us, and I can't imagine why they would want the let, they let the asteroid hit the Earth. But anyway, the um, issue is this September – a very significant time period for those reasons, and also uh, Matt Kahn, no relation to Jonathan Kahn, or just mentioned, Matt Kahn, who interviewed Helene Lipson on an episode of N5D Radio, said that he sees one-third of humanity being resonant with 5G consciousness by the um, full moon uh, lunar eclipse on September 28th. But when I interviewed Neil Kramer, he said he doesn't see that many humans being awake at that time. So I guess um, the this upcoming September... The Shemitah, the asteroid, the one-third of humanity by that lunar eclipse. Do you see anything significant about that time period? I, I'm i not really feeling it, to be honest with you. And, I, again, I don't want to be negative, you know, but I'm, I mean, one-third of humanity is quite a huge number. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, over a couple billion people out of the seven billion that are here. I mean, it would be nice if that were to happen. I mean, it could, you know, if, you know, the veil were lifted and and everybody, but I'm not really, you know, feeling it, you know, happening at at this point yet. All right. Well, folks, just 
wake up the sheeple, I guess. That's the way to do it. I mean, you don't exactly. have to be You don't have to be violent about it. You don't have to do what that guy in the movie They Live did to his friend who refused to to put on the glasses. You don't have to beat the crap out of the sheeple if they refuse to wake up. Just uh tell them what's going on and if they uh refuse to believe it, maybe get in their face a little bit. And if they have a nervous breakdown, well, then you realize that they're the kind of people that can't be woken up and, um, well, maybe you might as well give up on them. But uh, just try to wake up the sheeple, folks. And I apologize to anyone out there who thinks sheeple is a derogatory term, but I'm just using it because the, uh, the word's stuck. But enough of that. Let's get back to um, to your work. Um, we're almost done, um, done with this fifth dimension stuff, but what the fifth dimension uh, Earth will be like um well th- there's a lot of a debate here in regards to what it would uh be like i mean some people say we'd have crystalline bodies other would say no we would still have uh physical bodies that are non-crystalline but our way of life would be so much different everybody would be uh all service to self and all so that's one area of disagreement that people often have so i guess um briefly tell us what fifth dimension earth would be like sure um, well, just, you know, from my own personal experiences of what I experienced uh, five or six years ago, you know, in that wonderful state of perpetual peace, bliss, love, and joy, um, I noticed also when I was in that state of existence that um, everything seemed to manifest very easily. I mean, you know how, you know, we're here and... Sometimes our desires, you know, we can wish something and wish something and wish something and it takes a whole lifetime to manifest or it doesn't even manifest at all or it manifests in a way that we wouldn't even want it to manifest or in a strange way or in a negative way. Um, What I noticed is um, when you reach a higher level of consciousness, um, you don't even have to, you know, do anything and your um, desires or whatever you need is like seems to almost fall in your lap instantaneously. It's very strange. It just seems like everything is synchronized in such a way that you don't have to put as much hard work into it like we um, are so accustomed to having to do here on the third dimension Earth. Um, so it just seems like once enough of the emotional baggage is cleared away and once we're operating at a higher level of consciousness the energetic blockages aren't there anymore and it seems that you know in addition to feeling healthier and looking healthier and looking younger and um also you know feeling more peaceful and and just you know feeling a lot of love towards everyone and everything instead of the competition and everything mentality that most of the third dimension earth is in now um it's just more of what i would say the fifth dimension earth would be like would be more of a utopia or a euphoric you know kind of life in which we're no longer down here bickering and arguing with each other and competing with one another and, you know, trying to backstab people to get ahead in the greed and the materialism, the focus on the materialism and having to have the newest um, technological toys and gadgets and all of that and being, like you said, instead of being service to self, being, you know, service to others oriented, helping others, you know, generally, genuine, genuinely, (laughs) I can't speak here, um, caring for others and, you know, taking care of the planet better, you know, not, you know, depleting it of its resources and destroying the destruction and decay that tends to go on here in the third dimension or earth, you know, all of those things, just being operating on a higher level of consciousness and things, you know, not being so negative and things manifesting more easily and just, you know, basically what people have said throughout the ages, you know, heaven on earth existing, you know, pretty much is what it would be like if we can all get to that level. Right. Uh, Let's go to uh, talking about parallel universes now. This was discussed in an interview with Michelle Walling, but I'm going to take it to a whole new level. 
I did an in uh show all by myself uh back in the day when I had no guest um talking about what other dimensions, universes, realms, timelines and whatever would be like. Um and uh it it's basically to my understanding of it uh depends on one's um perception of reality. Like what what I'm talking about is some people see a universe with 12 dimensions Others see a universe with 22 dimensions. It seems that 12 dimensions and 22 dimensions are the um, two most common ones that people see. In my interview with George Kavaslis, my private session with him, he's a 12-dimensional universe guy. And I asked him, do you know why some people might see a 22-dimension universe? And he did tell me, yes, come to think of it, there is one section in my understanding of the universe that I could imagine someone might see that as a... uh, 10 layers but i see that as one layer so that's kind of um kind of makes a little difference in regards to what some people think a dimension is also um some people don't know the difference between realms timelines time streams dimensions parallel universes there's a lot of confusion as to what those words actually mean and whether they can be synonymous or not but i'll let you elaborate on that when i give you the floor to talk about this but i do want to talk about this thing about the higher planes on the website silverlegion.org uh, silver legion that's a group of uh extraterrestrial warriors who go to other universes and save people among other things and tanaf is the uh et contactee who um is the um communicator on earth a human communicator for the silver legion she talks about um higher planes the first layer is known as the ethereal plane it's the closest to planet earth it is essentially a fluid uh shadow duplicate of the physical earth you see things similar to how they appear in the physical world only they will be somewhat transparent and it's substantial there's the second layer which is the dreamlands um it's where we go when we are asleep and we dream everything there is fluid and uh malleable and then there's the third layer the astral plane um much like the dreamlands this layer is infinitely malleable though here you will begin to encounter entities that have their own existence completely separate from any part of the uh, physical realm. And then there's the barrier between astral and above. Um, Don't know who created it. It says uh, not everyone seems capable of crossing the barrier. Um, It's a very complicated thing, apparently. But uh, there's the fourth to sixth layers, the paths and the realms to spirit. The path is a space that exists between realms, and realms are discrete areas that persist over time individuals have attained a certain degree of mastery, may be able to influence the um, path and the realms. Out of the path and realms, you begin to discover entire worlds of existence that are not based in the physical and have never been. Entire species and races exist out here, blah, blah, blah. Realms are infinite. Um, infinite, which which means that basically anything can exist in the realms. Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy, for crying out loud, could exist in the uh, in the realms. And um, and beyond that is the um, Outlands. Uh, Silver Legion actually has um, a post in the Outlands. Uh, this is the area where the lines between this universe and the next begin to blur, where if you would take a step too far, you might end up in a world you thought was fictional or in an area and place where nothing works as you expected to. Um, the Outlands, not surprisingly, are not easy for people to go to. Well, uh, I basically tried to sum it up the best I could there. Um, like I said, a lot of people would uh, perceive those areas differently based on their own um, interpretation, as I explained earlier. So your understanding of what parallel universes, realms, timelines, time streams, blah, 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 all the rest of them are, you got the floor on this. Talk all you want. Sure. And my understanding is similar to what um, you just explained in regards to realms. They're like little areas. Um, I read some material one time. It's almost as if they're kind of like little kingdoms of their own. And they may exist within the same dimension. So, example, you know, the spirit world or heaven that we go to after we pass away is said to be in the fourth dimension so that fourth dimension could have different realms in it it could have you know you know one realm in one place another realm in another and they're completely different from one another um and i have heard that um the same sort of thing that you mentioned that in some of these realms you know different beings can exist that even in some realms humans 
human thoughts, what people have brought into existence based on their thoughts could in, even be in some of these realms like monsters or whatever. And, you know, of course, the dream, you know, plane or the d- realm that we go to when we dream. So these realms, from my understanding, is that, you know, dimension could be like the third dimension, the fourth dimension, the fifth. You know, we're here in the third dimension, heaven or the spirit world that we pass away into when we uh, die is the fourth dimension and then humanity is supposed to be ascending to the fifth dimension but within those dimensions the realms different realms can take place that are independent of each other and are completely different or are similar to one another and timelines um those um are you know, a little bit what I write about in my book, Traveling the Parallel Universes. Um, there are parallel universes that exist, and they some may be different from ours, and some may be um, pretty much exactly the same but have a few differences. Some of these parallel universes have duplicate copies of the Earth in them, and these parallel universes, they are existing independent you know independently of the other ones and so necessarily uh, what's happening in one parallel universe might not necessarily be happening in another so it's what it is is um these different timelines are created these universes so for example you have our universe with our earth in it there might be another parallel universe for example that has another duplicate copy of the earth in it um you know, maybe on that earth in the past, the Nazis won World War Two, And so instead of, you know, us. And so that in that universe, on that timeline, the history would be totally different. It's an alternate history. So timelines can deviate. Um, different events in history may or may not have taken place. They don't always have to take place. Um, it's my understanding that there are timelines that even can exist that are taking place right now as we exist, but they may be in a different time period. So there could be a duplicate copy of the Earth somewhere in another universe or on another timeline that exists back in the dinosaur days, back in the 1700s or even in the future. And so, you know, the spirit world, that exists there are realms there can be realms there um there are different dimensions third fourth fifth but there are also different universes that can exist with duplicate copies of the uh, earth in them or not necessarily have the earth in them and they can exist at their own energy vibration they can be in the third dimension they can be in the fourth or the fifth wherever so um and they all operate independently of each other but Sometimes when major events take place, like catastrophic, you know, big, you know, major events that affect humanity on a whole, sometimes those major events can be felt in the different universes. Um, If someone is intuitive enough, they can feel when something major is happening elsewhere, like a pole shift or whatever. So that's kind of in a nutshell my understanding of all of it. Yes, in regards to how our universe was uh, created, I will put created in quotation marks because some people uh, say it wasn't created. Like some would say there is no, there never was a big bang. And the fact that we are infinite consciousness implies that there is, there never was a big bang i i mean but do you think maybe that's taking it too far i mean is it possible that maybe some universes could have been created by what one might perceive as a as a big bang of sorts or is it maybe too complex for you or anybody else to to make sense of the idea of a big bang universe um i think it's quite possible that in some universes it was you know created by a big bang but i also see uh, tend to believe that it is also entirely possible that universes have been brought into existence without um, any big bang. Um, to me, 
Big Bang um, and all of that seems to suggest that we exist here as, you know, a random miracle and that there's no rhyme or reason to life. We're here just haphazardly existing and there's no rhyme or reason. We just all of a sudden by chance happen to come into existence, you know, as a human population and grow to the technology that we've grown to. Um, but I believe that, you know, that could very well have happened or may happen in some universes, but I also believe that there can be intelligent design in some of the universes and they can actually be created by beings or forces or whatever that are so beyond our comprehension, you know, that it's just, you know, blows your mind to just, you know, sit and think about it. <laughs> so I think that it can very well happen in either way, but I tend to believe that in the cases of Big Bangs, who's to say that someone or something didn't put it into motion, a higher source, you know, in the first place? Right, who's to say that? I noticed you write about uh, divine signs and uh, synchronicity in your Traveling to Parallel Universes book. Um, what is synchronicity? Well, in the case of seeing things like the numbers 1111 on a clock, um, some people like Silver Legion, Contact Teach, and Noth have said that's just the universe's way of saying, I am here, I am here, and I'm showing this to tell you I am here. Um, that's all it is. And uh, divine signs, I guess you could say that's another version of uh, of that. Now, why some synchronicities and signs are more profound than others, I guess one could say if the person that witnesses it is on more of a um, on a right path, so to speak, then their synchronicities and signs will be more profound and noticeable than someone who is not on as close on the right path. Although I could, I suppose there could be some exceptions to that, and why those exceptions would occur. Maybe you can enlighten us on that. So the idea of divine signs and synchronicities, and how there is no such thing as a coincidence, and why some people see more signs and synchronicities than others. Please tell us about that. Sure, I think that definitely. When we're more aware of divine signs and synchronicities, they tend to occur more. It's kind of like the more we're aware of them and the more we believe in them, the more that they tend to occur. And I believe that they do exist. And an example of that is the one that you mentioned, the 1111. You know, I, in regards to the parallel universes phenomenon, right before... I'm about to cross over into a parallel universe or an alternate reality. I see the 1111. It's 1111 p.m. or a.m. on the clock, and or someone sends an email that's dated, you know, with the time 1111, or there's something else, the number 1111 on a building or something. So I always know that I'm about to temporarily shift somewhere else because I see that number and. Uh, a lot of others have said that the 1111 symbolizes a portal opening um, either to higher dimensions or to other worlds and realms, and I would tend to agree with that totally because that's been my personal experiences as well. And um, I believe that, you know, the divine signs and synchronicities definitely do exist if we pay attention to them. I mean, most people they don't believe in it or they're too busy to pay attention. But if we do pay attention, they definitely are there. Thank you. I just want to talk about this thing you have here called the Mandela effect of people being dead and then alive again. The name Mandela effect is interesting. It's called that because I remember Mr. Katai in one of his recent uh, videos, Mr. Katai is this guy who does a lot of code analysis and things like crop circles and Google doodles. I've been uh, watching his videos a lot more often recently. In one of his recent videos, he talked about how George Herbert Walker Bush, he was recently taken to the, well, not recently, but a couple years ago, I think, taken to the hospital with a bad case of bronchitis. He went, he went to the emergency room um, and people, a lot of people his age, he was, uh, He'll be turning uh, 91 in, in a couple days. As a matter of fact, David Rockefeller will be turning 100 in a, on, on the same day. It's a coincidence they have the birthday on the same day, and they're both uh, major New World Order insiders. 
Um, but Mr. Cat, I said he thinks that George Herbert Walker Bush, he did die of bronchitis, but he was brought back to life using time travel technology through DARPA, CERN, and other technologies which have time travel technology that can be used to bring someone back to life who passed away. And he did mention Nelson Mandela as someone who um, did die a couple times but was brought back to life, although he did uh, die officially and they didn't bother to try and try bringing him back to life at this point. Um, and, uh, well, this whole thing about the Mandela effect, uh, people being dead and then alive again. Uh, tell us about that and how does it maybe tie into what Mr. Cat I said about how they would uh, bring someone back to life because they want them to be alive when the new world order takes over, which won't happen, but I'm just saying that's the reason they brought him back to life because they want they want Bush to be alive when the new world order takes over, not that that will happen, right? Uh, sure, yeah, the Mandela effect that I speak of in my book, Traveling to Parallel Universes and it was given that term because Nelson Mandela was said to have died by many, many people way back in the 80s, and then others remember him dying more recently. Um, so the Mandela effect in regards to the phenomenon of parallel universes is it takes place when a person um, recalls that someone died, but if they temporarily cross over into a parallel universe or alternate reality, now all of a sudden that person that they know for a fact died, was reported as having died, is now alive and well. And from one universe to another, um, they're dead in one universe, you know, died many years ago, or people remember them dying, you know, a year ago. But yet in the universe you're currently in, they are alive and well, and there are many reports that usually happens on the level of celebrities, um, not as much on a personal level, but it can happen on a personal level within someone's family or friend, you know, circle of friends, but it usually happens on a celebrity level. Um, for example, I remember um, way back in the 80s, the actress that played on our, the um, All in the Family TV show, the actress that played Edith Bunker, Jean Stapleton, I remember her dying way, way back a long time ago when she was pretty young, like in her 50s or 60s. And then with experiencing this phenomenon of parallel universes, people were reporting her as just having recently died and I'm left scratching my head no she died a long time ago because I remember thinking you know feeling sad because I liked her and thinking she died way too young you know years ago and so there are other reports of people celebrities like Larry Hagman for example dying and being alive and um, other reports of celebrities um so um it's very interesting, the concept, you know, that you brought up about some being brought back to life. Um, I think that um, it can all tie in together with this parallel universes phenomenon. Um, I, I know myself personally, I've experienced this Mandela effect myself, and I know of other people that have experienced it, incredible, you know, credible people that have experienced it as well. So it wouldn't surprise me if something like that was going on. Um, I mean, who knows? There could be cloning that's going on or anything. But with in regards to the parallel universes phenomenon, everybody is usually duplicated from one universe to another um, unless they're, you know, dead in one universe and alive in another. So it's very interesting. It's similar but yet a little bit different. Thank you. And you've also talked about people's memories here. Uh, this is interesting because when it comes to uh, people's perception of events on a timeline, that can be affected. One notable example of this that I've talked about many times in my show is how the powers that be <clears throat> have gone to great lengths to try to discredit Zachariah Sitchin and prevent people from knowing that his books were actually very accurate about the Anunnaki and the planet Nibiru and them coming to uh, genetically engineer Earth and such. And 
two people in particular, Arizona Wilder in David Icke's Revelations of Mother Goddess documentary, and also uh, 33rd degree Freemason Leo Zagami, former Freemason Leo Zagami, in his Project Camelot interview. They both said that Zachariah Sitchin worked for the Illuminati. He was a disinformation agent. Arizona Wilder even said that Sitchin was a reptilian alien who she saw shapeshift at um, satanic Illuminati ceremonies. And she said he was a disinformer and everything. And Akashic Records reader Andrew Bartzis, he said um, Sitchin's books, first three books, are very accurate. And I was scratching my head thinking, well, wait a minute, how could he have been accurate if he was a disinformer? And I asked Andrew Bartzis that when I met him at the... Uh, in 5D, returned to Atlantis Conference in Sarasota in um, October of 2013, and Andrew Bartz just explained to me that Arizona Wilder and Leo Zagami, they, um, their um, timeline memories had been affected. Bartz has explained in great detail on some interviews that timeline watcher entities can affect a person's physical body and, a, and their person's um, spirit body through a complex mechanism by which they can cause someone to perceive events differently. And that caused them to think that Zachariah Sitchin was a fraud, even though he wasn't. And the powers that be did that because, well, they didn't want people to know that Sitchin was accurate. I wish the world wasn't this complicated, but hey, this just goes to show you that people can have um, different memories because um, they go under some form of timeline shifting mind control, which caused them to experience events differently by having their physical and spirit bodies affected in a complex way. Do you maybe have any idea what Andrew Bartzis is talking about? Could you maybe elaborate on, on what he says in great detail? Sure. I have definitely experienced uh, exactly what you're talking about. And what I've noticed in regards to this parallel universes phenomenon is if you go to, if you cross over temporarily into a universe in which the history was different, you know, not everything, everything doesn't have to have been different in the past, but, you know, events in the past, um, you know for a fact exactly how something happened way back during your childhood or whenever or a couple of years ago. But when you cross over into these parallel universes that have different alternate histories, your memories of what it actually happened start to fade away and get start to be replaced by different memories of the alternate history. And so I have actually found myself fighting to hang on to my memories that I know for a fact truly did happen. And um, because I don't want to lose what, you know, actually happened to me or what happened in the past. So I can definitely relate with what they're saying because I know that, you know, these on these different parallel, in these different parallel universes or on these timelines, sometimes the histories can tend to be different. It's not always the case. And if you're not care careful... Um, your memories can actually start to be replaced by an alternate history memory. And it's not that the memories are necessarily fake. They just never happened to you in that way. And, and now you're ending up with memories that are totally different from what you actually experienced. So, yes, my experiences have been that that definitely can happen. Okay, let's talk about uh, numerology, switch gears and talk about numerology because uh, you read a book, wrote a book called Manifesting Success in Relationships, Career, and Business via numerology. Um, I'm guessing you didn't write one on astrology because you don't know as much about astrology as you do about numerology. Maybe you can answer that for me when I finish babbling away here. But um, anyway, in regards to numerology, I guess briefly for those that don't know, don't spend a lot of time talking about this because I have talked about it on previous shows. I don't think we need to get into it. People can do their own research, how numerology works, and then talk about some of these very significant numbers um, that you see like destiny challenge and pinnacle numbers, and also how one can use numerology to their advantage when they go about um, trying to have a successful life where things happen the way they want it to happen. I actually subscribe to the website numerologist.org, and I don't read all the messages they send me, but some of the more interesting messages I get through email, I do uh, check out and read. So numerology, important numbers, and um, why you chose that instead of astrology, just for the hell of it. Tell us about that. You got the floor. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm not 
very versed in astrology, to be honest with you. Um, haven't studied it, wouldn't know enough about it to write a book, so I wouldn't really want to go there. But numerology, to me, you know, and I don't want to criticize astrology, but it just seems to be a bit more easy. It's a bit more straightforward. You don't have to worry about the planetary influences and the lunar influences and all of that sort of a thing. It's just straightforward. You're just dealing with numbers. And the idea behind numerology is is that it uses the numbers in our lives to, you know, basically the numbers are thought of as energy because everything in existence energy, even Albert Einstein came up with the conclusion that everything in existence is energy. Nothing that exists isn't just, you know, simply energy. Everything's energy. So even our thoughts are energy, our emotions and numbers. And so numerology uses your birth date and your name that you were given on birth that's on your birth certificate. And uh, the letters in your name are converted to numbers and um You get different profiles, for example, your destiny number. Some people call it your soul urge or soul expression number, excuse me, and um, your soul number, your personality number, and your life path number, maturity number. And all of these numbers um, mean something. Um, These different profiles mean something as well. And um, when you sit down and do the numerology, you can form this profile with all of these numbers, the destiny number, uh, soul expression and an urge number and all of that and get a pretty good idea of what kind of energy is influencing your life and you can get some pretty interesting information from it like even find out some hidden talents that you might have for example that you didn't even know about um, some areas in your life that you might be um, you know good at strengths and weaknesses and what you need to work on and um, pinnacle numbers and challenge numbers. We're all born with challenge numbers, which are there to help us and to teach us to be stronger and that we can learn from pinnacles are our advantages and our strengths. And um, so what all of this means is that um, numerology is basically, we can form profiles about ourselves and it's, based on our birth date and our name and um, what numbers are in our lives and that equates to, you know, what energy is influencing our lives. And we can use that. Um, I realized and and decided to write a book on it that we can actually use, you know, the energy um, that we are um, carrying because we were born with a certain name and on a certain date that the energy that we're carrying actually interacts with the people around us and everything around us. And once we realize exactly what energy we're carrying, we can, you know, figure out exactly how it's going to react with other people and other circumstances. So um, the book that I wrote basically is about that. It's about how we can figure out our numerology, our name, for example, what energy it's carrying. And, for example, um, we're in a romantic relationship. We're starting a new romantic relationship with somebody. I mean, you can pretty much figure out how the relationship's going to end up either at the right at the beginning or at the end because of how our energies mix. And you know what energy you're carrying um, by your name and everything else and your numerology profile and what energy the other person's carrying, you can pretty much figure out exactly how the energy is going to mix. So it's pretty, you know, thing, and um, you can get a lot of information from it that's helpful. Thanks, I appreciate you going over that. Uh, let's switch gears here. Maybe we'll get back to numerology in a little bit, but uh, we're kind of running long time, so... Let's try to fit some things in here for meditation, for past life, star seed, soulmates, and beyond. Um, when it comes to uh, specific meditation, some would say the best way to meditate is to just meditate love from your heart chakra because you're infinite consciousness. You might as well just let all the uh, love radiate out because anything less is basically a waste. You want to 
you make the best of your meditation, so radiate love out, but others say, no, no, if you're, you're going to get bored if you do that kind of meditation all the time, and I'm sure you would attest to that because you write about how you can do all sorts of different things like past life meditation, star seeds, soulmates, and all the rest of them. Um, recording metaf- me- uh, meditations, metaphysical meditations, um, well, uh, why would you want to record a meditation? Uh, tell tell us about that. Sure. Um, it, it's basically um, when I first started out um, using hypnosis and past life regression, what I would do is um, go and use a tape recorder and record a meditation and then go lay down and listen back to it and explore my past lives and do all sorts of wonderful things, you know, astral travel and, you know, speak with my spirit guides and do all sorts of things with it. And so basically um, this book is for, you know, to help people. I mean, we can all go within, we can close our eyes and try to go in, go within and everything, but this book is to help people to, you know, that may be not, that may not have so much success by just simply shutting their eyes and trying to go within. Um, so this book is filled full of meditations that people can either record on a tape recorder or a digital recorder or using software like Audacity as a free recording software or even have a friend read the scripts while they're relaxing. Um, and, um, these scripts, you know, if you record them or have someone read them to you while you're relaxing, I mean, they allow you to explore your past lives, like, for example, the first life that you ever lived on the earth or the first life that you ever lived, period. Um, You know, you can explore. A lot of people think, believe that they came from another planet. They were incarnated elsewhere prior to coming here to the earth, and so you can explore that. Um, There are, you know, whole different areas that you can explore, um, may be able to see into any future lives if you're going to live any lives in the future, which can be beneficial so you can try to work on your issues now to avoid pitfalls in the future. And there's just a whole lot of of interesting areas that you can discover by um, doing, you know, this type of work, past life work and future life work with these types of meditations. Uh, thank you. And just to clear up the um, confusion, uh, star seed. Um, there seems to be confusion as to what a bet- difference between like a star seed, an indigo child, and a crystal child. I mean, are they basically all one and the same, or is there a difference between those those terms? And if there is, please tell us about that. Sure. Star seeds are people that. Um, have lived on other planets before. They were incarnated in a previous incarnation on another planet other than the Earth before. And some people, you know, know for a fact that they've lived elsewhere and some people kind of feel like they may have and other people aren't sure at all or don't know at all. Um, A lot of times starseeds, they get here on the Earth and they're uncomfortable here because it's you know dark and violent and they have a hard time fitting in don't feel like they belong um so that's what a star seed pretty much is and then indigo children are people that were born and i forget the exact years but i believe like from the 60s on up um at least through the 70s or so people that were born here um that have you know they're more opened intuitively uh they tend to vibrate, their energy tends to vibrate at a higher level than the mass public does. And um, they're here, you know, a lot of times have a lot of intuitive abilities. And um, I, I guess, you know, one way, there's this movie called Indigo, if people want to check it out. I don't know if you've seen it, but a um, very good depiction of an indigo child in that movie um, but that's pretty much what an indigo child are, and there are like other crystal children and all of those, and they're different generations of souls that have come here to incarnate on the earth, and each one has behavioral characteristics and whatnot, but the idea is, is that these generations of souls that came here came here to help the earth in some way to try to uplift the energy vibration of the earth and humanity, especially during these times in which we're supposed to be ascending to the fifth dimension. So that's pretty much what the difference is. And a lot of times the star seeds, 
are here as well to help humanity in some way. It also says here, discovering your power animal. What, what's that? Sure. Um, there are power animals, and um, they almost act like spirit guides, and they're said to be in our lives. We can have more than one, and they may be helping us in a certain area in our life. Some are here temporarily. Some are here you know, for a longer period of time. So we may be working on a certain project or whatever, and these different power animals are said to be here to help us in an area that we may need help in. And you can actually, I provide a meditation for that in my book. You can actually find out if you if you have a power animal and if so, what it is and if it's helping you in a certain area and you can ask it for any guidance or advice. It acts more, you know, like a spirit guide. It also says here, viewing the colors of your soul. Um, I understand that uh, chakras are often um, depicted as having different colors. The colors of the rainbow, Roy G. Biv, the uh, seven colors, um, starting red at the root chakra, going up to violet with the um, crown chakra. The heart chakra is the color green, which is um, like right in the middle. Green is a color of balance. Now, they say that that's why you want to get out in uh, nature a lot because there's a a lot of green, but that can also be used in bad ways. Like, why do the powers that be choose green as the color of money? Because they want us to um, feel a sense of balance towards something that is totally unbalanced. I mean, fractional reserve banking, it makes debt and inflation unavoidable. There's nothing balanced about that. So that's one way where the color green has been used to to screw us over. But I'm, I'm guessing that would mean that you want the color of your soul to be green. But am I mistaken about that? So maybe tell us about the viewing the color of your soul and what that means. Sure. Um, we're all said, you know, we're souls. And, you know, when we're out of this physical body, um, we may be depicted when we get to the spirit world or heaven, uh, whatever term you want to give it, um, we may be viewed as, you know, in many different ways. And in one of the ways is that we may be viewed as the color of our soul. And the color of the soul, it's different just so people understand. It's not the same thing as our aura. The aura is more temporary um, a lot of times the aura can show, you know, illnesses or, or personality traits and, you know, our mood or it can be affected in, you know, different ways. Um, you know, a lot of um, emotional baggage and everything that we carry around here while we're on the earth can affect our aura traumas and cause holes and everything um, in our aura, it's been said, you know. But um, the soul color is something that is, you know, us, it's the color of our soul, it's something that doesn't, it's not, it doesn't change as quickly as what the aura colors may change, um, because the soul colors are based on our soul growth, and it's exactly like you said, it goes through the color spectrum, so it starts out with the red, you know, of the younger souls, and, um, I don't want to say below that, but prior to that, you may have black souls, and that's said to be the colors of, like, tainted souls or damaged souls or even negative souls. And then you've got red souls that are younger, and then it goes up from there in the color spectrum to orange, to yellow, to green, to blue, and then into the purples and violet. And so the idea is is that, you know, when you're a younger soul, you're you're a red soul, it doesn't mean you're bad or you're negative or anything. It just means that you're you know, you haven't gone through a lot of soul lessons, you're just learning. It's kinda of like going through kindergarten through the twelfth grade sort of a thing. Um, and it's not that one soul is better than another. It just depicts, you know, where you are in your evolutionary growth, the growth of your consciousness. And um so your energy vibration can be affected by that as well, you know, where exactly you are and your level of consciousness and your soul growth. So that's basically what the colors of our soul are. And we're said to also have a halo. You know, some people have a halo around the core soul color. And 
that depicts some personality characteristics and I tend to believe that also depicts actually how old our soul is. You know, has it been around for a billion years or has it been around, you know, this is the first time that the soul is here as well. So um, that's pretty much in a nutshell what the soul colors are. Thank you very much. Uh, You're welcome. Yeah, let's talk about... uh... Remember in your interview with Michelle Walling, you talked about food for a little while because, uh, well, um, when it comes to food, what should humans be eating? Well, my understanding of this is we're actually not supposed to be omnivores. We're supposed to be herbivores, but we're not. I mean, it's an interesting fact that if you um, watch a lion eat its prey, the lion goes through a lot of trouble to eat the animal that it just slaughtered. It um, will basically eat everything in the animal that's edible besides the muscle tissue. And I remember seeing when I was a kid a lot of Discovery Channel um, shows where the lion would eat the animal, and a lot of the animal carcass was left after the lion ate. I'm thinking, did that lion just let that animal go to waste? What the hell is the lion's problem? Why? Well, no wonder it has to hunt so much because it wastes all the food. Well, I found out after listening to an interview by this uh, whistleblower named Pete Peterson, he pointed out that muscle tissue is actually toxic and for some inexplicable reason it affects the lion a lot more than well than it affects us but either way it is still toxic to eat muscle tissue and um that makes you think oh my god why the hell are we herbivores that i mean why the hell are we omnivores then it makes uh makes no sense well we are supposed to be herbivores like i said and i will say from personal experience that as mother earth has raised her frequency i have actually started eating a lot more fruits and vegetables in the past uh past couple of years still eat meat though and i don't actually feel any guilt or shame about it to be honest with you a lot of people would say you should feel guilt or shame about eating meat but i don't in fact i've recently started ordering edible bugs from thailand as a matter of fact um i think it's uh i think it actually suits me pretty well to eat a uh, little insects and such they are actually uh, kind of tasty i recommend uh other people try them too. They're a slight expensive though because they come from a foreign country that's across the ocean. But, but I think it is worth it, and I encourage stores to start selling edible bugs. But, but yeah, I haven't given up meat entirely, and I don't think I will because I really like meat a lot. But I know I shouldn't be eating it because humans are supposed to be herbivores. So, this whole issue of what humans should be eating, and also how we are supposed to be herbivores and how we will be um, eating less and less meat as time goes on. What do you have to say about that? Uh, it's very interesting because I actually wrote a blog article about that a couple of years ago about how when people go through the process of ascension to higher consciousness, um, they eventually begin to no longer crave meat and not need it neither because um, the idea is is that the food that is closer to Mother Nature is of a higher energy vibration, like your fruits and your vegetables and your like your nuts and, and grains. And um, so, as we raise our energy vibration increases, we tend to crave less of the denser foods, like the meats, for example. And so, it seems that a lot of people that have been on the path of ascension, it, it seems to happen naturally. It's not necessarily them deciding one day I'm not going to eat any more meat. Um, It tends to happen naturally. They might, for example, feel nauseated when they eat meat or not even be able to digest it anymore, Um, you know, have stomach pain, be nauseated. Um, If people get far enough along on the path of ascension to higher consciousness, they may even be able to, um, they may even feel emotionally, um, you know, sadness, you know, emotional sadness when they consume the meat because when you get to a higher level of consciousness, um, you feel like you're a kindred spirit with everyone and everything, including the animal kingdom. And so the thought of eating one of your brothers and sisters, I mean, um, emotionally, and I know to some this may sound wacky or whatever, but it's true. Um, The thought of consuming another being, you know, starts to weigh on you. And so when you start to vibrate higher and higher, and it's 
very, very interesting because many, many people who have been on the path of ascension have experienced this. And I did write it in a blog article and um, included it in the second edition of my book, How to Achieve Fifth Dimension Consciousness. But if anybody wants to read the blog article, it's on my website at beyond3dbooks.com and then backslash vegetarianism. And um, you can read the article there. It's quite interesting. And um, it, it's also interesting, too, and I wanted to point this out, too, and not to get, you know, religious on everybody, but I noticed that in the Bible it also says that, you know, in the book of Revelation when it talks about a, a, a utopian world of tomorrow, it mentions in there that someday there will be a day in which the lion eats alongside the other animals and draw, and it basically is, you know, talking about how also nobody kills animals or anything. So it tends to be very interesting because it's talking about, you know, a possible utopian world that may exist tomorrow in which animals eat alongside one another and don't kill one another and humans don't kill animals for consumption neither and the same thing um, that the Bible speaks about people are actually now experiencing as they go through ascension to higher consciousness so I wanted to bring that into um, into it you know that what you say is interesting that people are supposed to be herbivores and you know if we go to a higher level of consciousness, definitely, I think it will definitely happen. Um, more and more people will just tend to lose their interest in it, you know, eventually. Yes, but just some general advice for those that do like to eat meat. I mean, if you're going to eat meat, there are said to be the good some good ways to, to go about it. Um, like, first of all, uh, make sure the animals don't have any, like, um, they're trained all in an all-organic, fed all-organic food, treated the proper way, because, like, if the animal is abused before it's eaten, then that negative energy will be in the food that when you eat it, and you don't want that. Um, some would right. also say you might want to kill the animal when it's happy. A good analogy that I use to describe this is the book of Mice and Men at the end of the book, when George kills his um, friend Lenny, he tells Lenny to look out in the distance and imagine rabbits. And the last word, because he knows George, he, he, excuse me, he knows Lenny loves rabbits, loves rabbits with all his heart. So when, after, right after he says the word rabbits, he knows that Lenny is happy. And right after he says rabbits, he shoots Lenny in the back of the neck, killing him instantly. And he knew that he died a happy person because the last word he heard before killing him was rabbits. Well, one could say, likewise, you want to kill an animal when, A, it's not, it doesn't know you're going to kill it. And, B, when it's in a state of happiness because, well, anything less, then you're going to get the uh, negative energies of the animal into you when you, um, w when you kill it. And some would also say there are certain meats that are not as sinister and evil to eat as other meats, like um, like fish and bugs. Those are two animals that they're plentiful. They run abound all over the world. They're a lot more popular. Some species of bugs and fish are than are other animals that um, that are like red meat type animals that you that you really shouldn't eat as much of because they aren't as plentiful or big in number. So the the this all the stuff I'm saying about the best ways to kill animals and the best types of meat to eat relative to others. Is there any comments you'd like to give on that? Um, sure. Um, well, <laughs> I'm vegetarian, so I wouldn't advocate. I don't want to advocate killing animals. Um, I definitely agree with what you said about you know eating an animal, for example, that was sad or been abused or whatever, you're taking that into yourself because, you know, as um, I mentioned before, everything is energy. And so if that animal experienced sadness or trauma or anger or anything, when you eat it, you're just taking in that sadness, that trauma, that anger too. So you're taking in, you know, everything that the animal you know, felt and held on to. And um, if people, I believe if they're intuitive enough, they would probably even be able to feel it. And so I definitely 
agree that, you know, you're taking in exactly what the um, animal's carrying or what they experience, and now you have it inside of you. Okay, any comment on, like, eating fish and, and bugs is better than eating other types of meats, or is there really no difference in that regard to you? Well, it's it's been said, you know, that um, red meat is even denser, you know, and for whatever reason, I'm not sure. I mean, we all know that red meat is, has more cholesterol than fish or fowl or whatever, um, but it's also said that, you know, the meats are denser than, denser energy than what vegetables, for example, and fruits are, and so... Um, I would think that something that's lighter in energy vibration would be better to consume. All right. Thanks for giving your take. Uh, let's switch gears, go back to the whole thing about meditations for past life, star seeds and soulmates. Last thing here, it says um, your soulmate, your twin soul. Uh, a couple of questions about this. When it comes to uh, soulmates, first of all, um, a lot of people, when they say uh, your soulmate is your lover, like your boyfriend, your girlfriend, or your wife, and others say, well, no, in some cultures, a soulmate has nothing to do with whether you're in love with them or in a relationship or infatuated with them. It's just someone that you can relate to on a soul level because you have a lot in common. It doesn't have anything to do with whether you're married or in a relationship with them. And then you also have here in parentheses twin soul. Is that the um, different or the same as a twin flame? And um, also tell us what is a soulmate, twin soul, twin flame. T compare and contrast those uh, terms, please, for those that are confused. You, by the way, you got um, sure. eight minutes and 20 seconds left on the live feed. Okay, great. Um yeah, um, a soulmate, and um, there's a good little book that was written about it um, by Elizabeth Clare Prophet about soul. It's called Soulmates and Twin Flames, and um, she says that soulmates aren't necessarily a romantic partner. I mean, they can be, but the soulmates can be anyone that comes into our life to help us with our soul growth, whether it be temporarily or for a long period of time or for our whole lives. And so soulmates can be um, anyone who, like our mom or dad, brother, sister, anyone that can come into our to our life to help us to learn our soul lessons, whereas a twin soul is supposed to be our other half. The idea behind it is that we um, split off a long time ago. We originated from the same point of consciousness. We were like a divine whole, and we split off. It's kind of like identical twins. You know, they come from the same physical cell, and um, the cell divides in half. It's similar to that in that um, the twin souls, they came from the same, she uses the term Ovid, so it's the same divine whole, and they split off and then they incarnate on their own separately over, you know, many, many lifetimes of incarnations. And so um, the twin soul is more of our um, perfect other half. Um, they could be more thought of as our um, perfect partner, a perfect romantic partner, whereas the soulmate could be, you know, anybody that comes into our life to um, help out in some way. Thank you. And let's finish this um, this interview on a uh, note dealing with Earth history, because it says here, viewing the Earth's history under this uh, meditation for past life, starseed, soulmates, and beyond uh, thing. What was the Earth created as? Um, well, Akasha Gricker's leader, Andrew Bartis, who is my number one source, he says that Earth was created as a seven-dimension seed planet. I believe it was seven-dimension, he said. And the unique thing about the seventh dimension, it has been said that once you get there, there is no more service to self. Now, don't get me wrong. The fourth, the fifth, and the sixth dimension, they're a lot more wonderful than the third dimension. But the, there is a catch, though, and that is even up until the sixth dimension, the entities there still do show 
some degree of service to self behavior. But once you get to the seventh dimension, there is no more service to self. It's strictly service to others. And then once you get to the eighth, ninth, and tenth and beyond, the service to others is a lot more profound and wonderful than than it was in the seventh dimension. That's what he says the earth was originally created as, basically a, a seed planet for people to learn how to no longer be service to self. And he also said that all those people who say that the first aliens to colonize the earth were reptilians were completely wrong. Now, there's some debate here. Some might say that those um, Alpha Draconian reptilians, they may have been the first to plant the flag here on Earth from a standpoint of galactic colonization, but they were not the first ones here. There were other benevolent, strictly benevolent entities that were here long uh, before them. And also some people, there's some debate here, like um, Peter Kling, I interviewed him recently. He said that Earth would have been a lot smaller in the past, and over the course of time, it would have gotten a lot bigger with all the asteroids and meteors uh, hitting the Earth, causing it to get larger. But um, Andrew Bartzis has actually said, no, the Earth was actually a lot bigger um, in the past than it, than it is now, a lot bigger noticeably, and it has um, shrunk over the course of time. Like um, one example that people might know of where the Earth got smaller was uh, Zachariah Sitchin. He talks about how the Sumerian tablets say that um, one of Nibiru's moons collided with uh, – the Earth and the part of the Earth that got chipped off, it became the asteroid belt, and the rest um, formed the Earth that we know of now. That's one of the example in history where the Earth uh, got smaller than what it was. And um, But this whole thing about um, Earth's history, what it was seeded as, what it was originally, who colonized it, um, you got uh, two minutes and uh, two minutes, 30 seconds to talk about this. What do you have to say about this? Sure. Um I actually believe that, um, I, I mean, there are a lot of theories like you mentioned, but I believe that it has been, you know, seeded um, basically with souls that need to be here. And um, I believe that there, you know, have been many different civilizations here and everything, of course, but um, it, it's basically seeded with, whatever souls need to be here for their soul growth because basically the earth is just a school, you know, and so it's here for um, us to learn from. So those that need could benefit from learning from it have been sent here and um, as a soul to incarnate here, whether it be as an animal or a human or whatever. But um, I also, um, believe that you know there were other races of you know beings here and and whatnot you know scientists have found you know the neanderthal bones and things of that nature i've done past life regression and you know gone into you know my past as neanderthal so i um definitely believe that the planet has been seeded throughout time, you know, maybe with different races and whatnot. And um, some people believe, you know, that their hybrids have been here and everything else. And it it all just depends on what souls, which souls need to be here and which vehicles or bodies are the best ones to be in here inhabiting. And so I think it definitely can, the seeding definitely can and does take place. Thank you, Trish. I guess I have to bring the show to an end. We could go past the uh, live feed, but I don't see really any point in doing that. Um, so I'll bring the show to an end, and I'll do that by telling you the um, same thing I tell all of my guests. Trish, you are a fascinating individual, and I have no doubt that if I wanted to, I could do another show with you. But one of my goals with this radio show is to get as many different guests on my show as possible before I give any one specific guest double dips because I feel that that is the fairest, most impartial, and most informative way of doing a radio show that seeks to expose the true and false nature of reality for what it is and what it isn't. And that does mean that I regret to say 
I probably will not be asking you to come on my show again, but please understand that's only because I need to give thousands of other fascinating individuals a chance to have some glory on my radio show. But mark my words, I will make sure that this interview gets spread far and wide. I will upload it to YouTube and try to spread it out there after I do so. It was a pleasure having you on. People will certainly learn a lot of things, and their consciousness will certainly become expanded from listening to this. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. I really enjoyed it. I'm glad you did. Namaste, Trish. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Next week, folks, I'm going to have Simon Parks on. Definitely going to want to listen to to my interview with Lily Earthling because she claims to have uh, debunked some of him, some of the things he said. Going to want to take some notes with that interview I did with Lily, so I'll be ready for that. So Simon Parks next week. I'm sure Simon means well. But next week we'll have him. Namaste.